everybody, welcome to One More Round with Josh Norris. Today I'm super excited. I've got Jackie Sabo with me, founder of AIR, which is the Arizona Interior Resource. Uh, but I've known Jackie for quite some time. She's got more energy than most people I've ever met in my life. Uh, fascinating. So we're going to have a lot of fun today. Make sure you like, leave a comment for us, subscribe to the channel. You don't want to miss episodes like this. Welcome, Jackie. Well, thank you so much, Josh. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I know. I'm exciting. Uh, excited because, you know, as we were talking, we've been in the same group for a while, yeah. but we haven't ever really had this kind of time to sit down, you know, and, and learn more about your story. I do know that you are you have an incredible business, that uh, you just started a new one, mm -hmm. uh, but you've been in the interior design space for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, you also are an avid runner and hiker and have done it competitively, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, so. Tell me a little bit. How did you get started in your career? Where did where did you get started? Right. So I'm a third generation native Arizona. My grandmother came at the turn of the century. Wow. And mom, I'm one of a big family, and my father was in the boat industry, so recreational watercrafts, mm -hmm. and in the 60s moved us to northern Indiana. And uh, in northern Indiana, I uh, went to school and studied business classes and music and did sports. And when I was getting ready to graduate from high school, uh, one of the other girls in the class, the harpist, Lynn, said, hey, I'm going to go to Purdue and I'm going to study computer science. And I was like, wow, what's computer science? So I went to Purdue and studied computer science for an associate's degree. Um, focused on business applications. And it was there that I um, understood, as mother so beautifully says, I'm Native American and Irish, and she said, uh, the sooner that you learn that you're a warrior rather than a squaw, you'll be happy in life. I like that. So I was sitting in the op center reading punch cards and completely bored out of my mind, talking to everyone in the center and the, the guys that were there like, uh, you know, stop talking to me. And I was wearing roller skates with a fanny pack and Q-tips and I was roller skating around cleaning off tape drive heads and it was just a different time and when I finished school I came back to Arizona because it's really where all my family is and I started to work at a bank and the bank uh, I wanted to be at the op center I really thought I'm gonna be a programmer but maybe I can do technical sales and they said you just don't have the experience so they put me in the bank properties department mm -hmm. and here's the thing about bank properties it's dirt it's construction it's real estate mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to do computers, man. I want to do dirt. You yeah. know, I want to get involved in this. And yeah, so ground up projects, ground up projects. They were doing branches. But of course, I was this skinny little 22 year old. And um, so I was the procurement clerk and I got to test all of the equipment, all of the different typewriters. And there were word processors that were coming out. And but the economy was not good. You know, prime interest rate in the early 80s was 21 and a half percent. And wow. business was not you know, very yeah. good. And I realized that I would have to move out of the bank in order to uh, make my trajectory. So my next step was a commercial real estate firm and I was a telemarketer and I would generate leads for the leasing agents. And a lot of these guys are senior guys now that are in big, powerful places. But, you know, I was a kid, I'm like, I got you that 400 square foot requirement. Why aren't you chasing it? Yeah. And I just got frustrated. So I started out on my own and did leasing and then moved into property management. And one thing just kept you know, stacking on top of another. And it felt really clear to me that I was gonna be responsible for the physical space. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I went to work for Goodman's Interior Structures in the early 2000s, right before the, um, the recession. I was hired fourth quarter of 2007. And we had 260 employees and in five quarters we went to 130 and we were doing colleges, hospitals, government space and we could see six months out that there was going to be a train wreck. But I was responsible for managing three large sales organizations and I started paying close attention to how they felt when they were working. Like, you know what it's like to own your own company, but yeah. when you're a quota carrying guy or gal mm -hmm. and the recession is going this way and your quota is going up and up and up, I just really got curious about that and really got involved in leadership and development and coaching and trying to build the necessary strategies to manage stress. And of course, the first one is rest and nutrition and movement. Mm -hmm. That's the first one, yeah. right? And so developing some other strategies. And so it was in that environment that I began to shape who really I was going to be. And it's said that you know when you're up to 40, you should say yes to everything because we don't have enough body of work to determine like, what are we going to be? 
But you know, when you get in your 40s and 50s and 60s, you start saying no, because yeah. you know what your truth is. Yeah, so. and you have wisdom to say no because of, instead of just like no because of something you haven't experienced. No, you've exactly. experienced it. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. smart. So it just went, one thing led to another, and I found myself in an opportunity to be able to be a partner, and I was in a partnership for four years. And we were really, as a result of COVID, kind of changing the model for office furniture, excuse me, significantly. If you're buying furniture for your house or even this table, mm -hmm. you go into a store, you look at the furniture, you ask the guy for a price, he gives it to you. If you like it, you buy it. If you don't, you go to store two, store three, and then you hop on the internet, right? Yeah. That's what happens with office furniture. But the problem with it is, is that they're, you're not just getting sticks of furniture, they're trying to lay the whole space out. So when you go to a dealership, a traditional dealership, and you ask for the cost of furniture, they have to spend two or three weeks lined up behind their institutional clients, their big corporate clients. Mm -hmm. So if you're a small business owner and you don't know the price of furniture, after two or three weeks, you get a proposal, it's $120,000. Yeah. And if you're, if you're smart, you'll lop the price off and you send it to the second dealer and the third dealer. Well, we recognize each other's companies. We know there are premium products mm -hmm. like the Lexus, Mercedes, BMWs. Furniture's the same way, Herman Miller, Hayworth, Steelcase, Knoll. And then there's mid-market, mm -hmm. right? There's American brands. And what happens with the buyer is that there's a lot of decisions to be made. And now what's happening is that it's so overwhelming. The only thing that they truly recognize is the price tag. And so they pick the lowest price. Yeah. I felt like I don't have a showroom and I have 140 manufacturers in the region that are small business owners just like me. They weren't going to give me a bunch of free furniture to put on a floor. And I, I was operating out of my bedroom in the beginning. But my partner, after 10 years, b built a building mm -hmm. and filled it full of furniture. And it was gorgeous, except for when the clients go in, they're not seeing what they want. So I thought, well, I've been doing this for a really long time, and my MBA is in economics and finance and analysis. Can't I just go through and look at all of my deals, pull out the big one and the small one, and evaluate what the cost of furniture is for a traditional user? Yeah. So I can come in the very first meeting and set the design intention. If you just want carpet and paint, it's going to be 15 cents a square foot for your test fit and a couple of other things. If you are building your own building or own your own building and you want to gut it, now it's an architectural solution. It will bring the architect and the general contractor in quickly, work with them directly. We're on the sidelines coaching to make sure it's moving along. And then also be able to quote a price for furniture. So the last client I went to see, Mastel Linen, 100-year-old family-owned business. Wow. So I've got the great-grandson. And they're building their own facility. And this was a referral. We love our business. So you, know, you and I both do the same thing. We get wonderful referrals. And so I met with him. He said, I've got 2,500 square feet. And I'm like, it's going to be about 50,000. But that's going to include the design that you need, the delivery and installation, tax, and everything. When we got in there, he had a 3,700 square foot building. And so we came back with a $70,000 budget. But now we've got something to work for. Right. So then I can take him out to other tenant spaces, other companies that I've done, other manufacturers. And he's going in to see what $20 a square foot is. And he's talking with that owner, and the owner's saying, look, you know, do your research. <laughs> There's some things I missed. I didn't. And embedded in all of this is what are the overall objectives of your company? What are you doing, Mr. Owner? What are you doing, Josh, for your company as you're going through these changes? What are you trying to achieve? If you're a call center, are you attracting and retaining talent? Are you trying to acquire customers? Are you trying to save money or make money? Is it a brand concern? All of that kind of sets the vibe yeah. combined with all of the research that's come flooding through recently about the kinds of environments that multiple gen generations enjoy. Yep. So, right, a baby boomer is going to look at it different than a Gen X and a different a millennial and an engineer is going to look at it different than a, you know, a practitioner for medicine versus an ops director for a big installation company or a right. big industrial company. One thing I love about that, and I don't want to interrupt you, but no, it's I want to hit on the point where you're talking about taking people and showing them, hey, this is what this looks like, yeah. so they can get a visual and a feel of, okay, cool, that's like a, a diet, you know, or a conference table and, right. and chairs, that's what that would look like. Here's what the offices are laid out, and the $20 a square foot, it gives them that visual so they understand, 
and they get to feel. It's like it's yeah. just a different modality than just hearing you do it or looking on a piece of paper at a price. Right. You, you take that white glove uh, experience and then you get them into the space and they, they're going to feel better about spending the money. We do the same things with websites. You yeah. Know, when somebody, it's exactly the same process, absolutely. I think. It's a creative process of exploring who they are as a company yes. and what's most important to them and then showing them examples, right? Yeah, yeah, so that they it. can understand. When we come with a price and they come back and say, well, yeah, it's a little out of our budget. And we say, I totally understand. But let me show you some sites that we've done and so you can understand what you're getting for that price. And right. then let me take you down to a lower price point of, you know, we didn't build it, but I can show you some other uh, websites and let me show you the difference. Walk yeah. you through it, you know, page speed load. The way it's designed to convert and be easy to read, very palatable pieces of information. Right. And when they see that, and I always, when, when it comes to this, I always do it on a video call. Like yeah. we actually never do a design. That's funny. That's a great them. part of what's going on now. We do a yeah. lot of video calls with ours as well. Because once you you are on a call with them, like, and we've let's say we've gotten the client, and then we do our initial design for the website. We get them on a video call and we explain why we designed it that way. Right. And here's where the conversion points are. And then right. like you can see their eyes opening rather than letting them go by their own devices and say, oh, I like it because of a color or whatever. Yeah, and we want them early on to relax about the budget. Look, mm -hmm. there's 140 manufacturers. We can change quality or quantity. We can get to any budget. We like can that. scoop out scope. Mm -hmm. Maybe what we've got is we've got a mental health professional. There's a lot of mental health professionals that are coming out, but it's not the same that it used to be where it's a waiting room in an exam area. Now they're incorporating things like cold plunge and ultraviolet ray and different types of activities that individuals can go in between their talk therapy or in between when they're working about the pharmacology and trying to figure out like what needs to be happening with the mm -hmm. body. And so we said to them, look, your budget is $80,000. It's a 4,000 square foot space. Really to do this right, our vision is introducing sens sensory items that's going to build resiliency, mm -hmm. right? And he said, wow, you must have uh, suffered from some mental illness. You seem to have a first hand. <laughs> right. Hey, we're all a first-hand experience, <laughs> and I said to him, no, I personally haven't, but look, you know, somebody's coming in and they're freaking out. Wouldn't it be nice if there's water there? And so now they're mindful of the water, right? Because we live in our heads when we're freaked out. Yeah. So I had an experience with mental illness because I was an outside straight commission salesperson, and I managed outside straight commission salespeople, and, and we're kind of kooky people. Yeah. But I think once they can get away um, and not worry about the budget and understand how we can bring it down, what it does is it reduces the pressure. I don't want to pressure you into a number. I don't like it. Like if we go somewhere on a car lot and somebody walks up and says, hey, can I help you? I'm like, no, get away from me, right? Like mm -hmm. I want to do all my research. I don't want to be pressured. And so when they can do that, now the magic happens because now you're talking about what are you trying to do with your company? Mm -hmm. You realize what this element in your particular case, which is so new, most people don't understand. You know, 50, 60 year old person is like, I don't, I don't know what search engine optimization is. I don't know what page speed is. Why does it matter to me? And so now we've kind of tucked the budget away for a little bit. And now you can just get into like really helping them understand all of the decisions and what their options are. Right. And that's a whole different way. So we go and meet clients and we're not, when I left Goodman's, it was commodity business, and it broke Adam Goodman's heart, I think, mm -hmm. because Adam and his father Murray and his father Edward, and they had a, they had an apartment down below. They were in um, Boys Town, Derman Town in Philadelphia, and mm -hmm. I went to the place where their furniture store was down below, and the apartment was up above, and they'd knock on the door at night, and the sons would stick their head over, and they'd come in, and they would talk to him, you know, I just got off of a boat. I just, my family's fleeing. I don't have a home or whatever. And we're going to, and it was never about economics. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you wake up and it's 75 years later and every single person you're talking to, and if you're selling a premium brand, yeah. you're either going to compromise your margin. And if you do that too much, you're gonna, not you're really going to be business. here. <laughs> right. And so I love now when we can put that budget together and they may say, it's not time for me. Because in my life cycle of my business, I'm bedroom, kind of inherited space. But when my company grows, I want to be in touch. And that's where we ought to have those touches. That's yeah. where we have to have those relationships and those connections. Yeah. Well, and we were talking offline. And what was really cool is you were talking about how companies, that, you know, 
know, you said, I think bedroom, but let's say it starts in a garage, right? right? And then you get like a co-working space. And then, you know, as a company grows, you need space for, you know, your people and uh, something that, again, that's going to be not only attractive to, to them and to keep the work morale high, but those are phases. So if you yes. can, if your marketing is geared towards not all, all three of those phases, you can talk to somebody that started in their garage and two years later now can use you, but they couldn't use you back here. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, it's an interesting thing to think about when mm -hmm. you're you know doing your marketing. And I know you're really good about it because relationships are what see, seems to be one of your specialties. Right, and I'm I'm crawling out on a limb now and starting to write blogs. And you know when you write in uh, MBA school and you're writing analysis reports and you're a programmer, mm -hmm. the blog language is different. And so I think I'm a pretty good writer. You know yeah. and I've got a coach and I've got people helping me and they're like, yeah, no, that's, we're not going to tell that story. We're going to tell a different story. And I want you to think about this. I'm like, no, that doesn't really, like you're selling, Jackie. You don't have to sell. I want you to kind of paint a picture of the experience that they're going through. Oh. And so even listening to your previous blog guest, the one that did the fitness facilities, they yeah. were doing it in their home, and I was just thinking about his journey, and I could really visualize like what it was like as you got out of your car and moved through the back of his yeah. property and into his garage and into the outdoor spaces and into the house. And it was like, he's protecting his quality of life yeah. when he's doing work with other clients and with his partner, mm -hmm. right? And so, gosh, I mean, it's a pretty heady thing to think if we could protect the quality of life for people when they come together and work, wouldn't that be wonderful? But the truth of the matter is, is it doesn't always happen. And I have to believe that this is really a vocation for me, that sometimes my purpose isn't met, but I believe the creator, I believe the higher power, whatever you want to call yeah. it, says, this is your place. You've worked around design, construction, real estate. When I was a little girl, when we moved to Indiana, they had, it was in the 60s, and they were just starting to do suburbs. And my dad moved us out in the suburb. It was Fort Wayne, northern Indiana. And he moved us into a suburb. And we were the first house on this probably 200 house track. Mm. So it was dirt. They had the streets in. And the reason he wanted us up there is he wanted to be close to Bremen, where one of his manufacturers was. And she said, I want you to know something. When you were in the fifth grade, I would be looking for you. The rule was you had to be in the house before the street light was on. Mm -hmm. And she said, I would be looking for you, and you weren't home in time for the street light. And I would look across the field, and there you would be on the ground, bent over something. And so I would walk over, and you would have layouts. You would have two by fours, the perimeter of an office, a house, with all the rooms broken out. And you would have, because we didn't have trash yeah. pickup, we had incinerators. So we're taking old bottles and old cans, and those were going to be the items that go. I was accessorizing and laying out stuff when I was in the fifth grade. And so when I got to this point in my life, to be in my late 50s and say, when my friends are retiring, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to start this company. And I said, Mom, I'm compelled. And she said, she told that story. And I was like, are you kidding me? I don't even remember that, right? Like, so, so when cool. you pick something yeah. that is really aligned with what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. then it doesn't become each transaction, like, I got to get this deal done. Yeah. It becomes connecting with somebody else and blessing them. Like, you want to sell your stuff, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest it all right, that we don't want to sell it. our stuff because we do. Yeah. But there is purpose. Yeah. And so if you can just move them along, but better yet, have some connection. Because here's what happens. Four years later, you run into them, and they hear your squeaky voice, which I, I have a squeak. The exact more excited I get, it's squeaky. I've had people come up behind me and go, "Oh my God, Jackie, we met four years ago at this event, and my company needs stuff. I always wondered what happened to you." And I think, "All right, th thank you." You know, you know it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of cool that you're talking about this right now. So I'm reading a book. It's called The Breakthrough Code. And it's oh, by Tom McCarthy. I've heard that. It, I should write that down. It's such a good book. But one of the principles, it's basically about this young kid in sales that's being taken through this journey by these other successful people. And one of the principles that was taught um, is not you're not just selling. What he did is he went into companies and help them uh, from an HR standpoint, basically get more joy and fun mm. out of their jobs, right? right? And they had some softwares that help with this and then tracked it. But he had to tie his purpose to, I'm really helping people. And he, once he did that, he started to enjoy so much more of what he's selling because, again, he wasn't just trying to get dollars and hit his quota. It's like, no, I'm, I'm changing and helping people's lives. And, like, you're doing the same kind of thing, and I can tell yes. you're passionate about it. And I think yes. everybody who's in business has to realize that you have the opportunity to do that.
Right. I mean. And here's the other thing, and thank you for the compliment. The other thing is, is that you can start over any time during your day. Yeah. You can start out in the morning with your quota and go, look, what get, what's today? The 30th. It's the last day of the third quarter. I got to hit my numbers, right? Yeah. And you get on the phone and the first gal just gives you the business and you can't get, but you know, you can pause for a moment and restart your day. My husband grew up in Montana and he was an avid runner. He was a mar um, um, ultra marathoner and both of his knees blew out and he was the one that introduced me to running and hiking and in these last several years he's had to have knee replacement. He said, Jack, one of the things I, that's really important to me is that when you're on the Grand Canyon, I want you to linger. I want you to pause. You're going to feel cold or wet or hungry or tired or irritable, but I want you to pause and see the grandeur that's around you. And, like we need to be lingering when we're doing our work, right? Yeah. And that's why I think COVID it was so important really to our evolution as a uh, people that work in a work environment because you got to be in your space, but you had to deal with a million moving parts, right? So if you've got pets, if you've got children, if you've got several roommates, if you've got spouse, maybe you got elderly that are sick or whatever, and you're trying to figure out a way to soothe yourself, right? Yeah. But you can do it because you're in your space and you don't have all those outside influences, right? You can get really, really mindful and deliberate. And now you want me to come back to the office? Come on, really? Yeah. But the thing is, is when we come together, Josh, you know this, when two humans are in the same space, some major stuff happens that can't happen on the Zoom call or the Absolutely. telephone call. Absolutely. The one and plus one plus three. Yes. Or equals three principle, you know, Stephen Covey, like that, that's you yes. and I getting together, having a conversation and, and it's so difficult. Like even a lot of our you know, people that work, you know, at Aftershock, they still are remote, but I do my best to try to get in front of them as much as I can because, yeah. you know, it is easier for them to do what they do, Yeah. but I do miss a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for the evolution of what's happening in the work environment. So that leads me to my next little topic that I wanted to talk about, which is I started, uh, I was born in the 50s, believe it or not, and wow. I started selling newspapers door to door in the early 60s and then went into uh, fast food. And this was in northern Indiana, which is in the heart of the Rust Belt. So automotive industry everywhere. And I remember all my friends, a lot of my friends' dads were gone during second shift. So we would hang out at each other's houses and have a bag of corn chips and some orange soda and watch like the Disney movie or whatever is on TV on Saturday night. And those men were really people that were taught a skill or a craft because they were on a line. So like your job is to do this, 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 and this. There really wasn't a lot of thinking really. What it was about is operational efficiency, showing up, making sure that you learn the stuff, making sure that you ask the right questions. And that's really what the work environment was for the Industrial Revolution. Now, of course, I'm simplifying it, sure. right? It's a hasty generalization. But, but if you hold on to that, then when I was in school in the 70s and the 80s, and I came out, and the advent of computers, mm -hmm. you know, Purdue had this IBM System 34, and where the drivers were, it was a literally a 4,000 square foot space. And I did wear roller skates and I did skate up and down and clean the tape heads off. And it was a raised floor and was punch cards. Mm. But this is where we are really starting to, as companies, understand the impact of globalization and transportation and telecommunication and communication, mm. right? So in the 70s, you are still tethered to your computer at your desk. And if you want to get up out of the secretarial pool and go talk to somebody else, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah. Because that machine and that landline are there. So if we fast forward and get to the 90s and then into 2000 when I went back to get my graduate degree, now we, the, we take this with us. Yeah. So now the critical thinking and the emotional uh, intelligence and all of those other things that need to be happening in the work environment if you're in a good sized company, you've got an owner that probably has a great vision and knows what they want to do, and you have the worker bees. So you've got the thinkers, you've got the doers, right? The creatives. But their line managers, where's their training and development so that they understand, like, how do I motivate this guy who's introverted or this gal who's an engineer and doesn't really care at all what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? And how do we make things be productive? And it's a quagmire. And it's why I love being part of our group that you and I belong to, yeah. Trustegrity, because we have people like Rachel from Fahrenheit that mm -hmm. does all of that consultative work. And we ask her, like, you know, is this normal? Like, 
a lot of why my clients who we put into the dreaded cube mm -hmm. do not want to go back to the dreaded cube is not necessarily because they're not going to see the people that they like at work. Mm -hmm. It's their line manager is managing them in a way that really isn't palatable anymore. Yeah. Like I've evolved as this person and I can get my work done all day long, but now you're going to come in and stand over my shoulder and better yet, the technology is watching me, right? It's big brother. Yeah. It's watching me. And so what we're trying to do, if you look at my logo for air, it's a box and air is blasting out of that box. We're trying to get out of the box and we turned it sideways and moved it upward and we turned it sideways for playfulness and moved it upward just because it's less upward yeah. and onward. And when we're talking with clients about this and they're saying, look, I want to change my work environment. I want my leaders to be involved, but I can't ask my employees because they got 50 different thoughts. And so how are we going to get that all together? And we can come in with the assistance of somebody like Rachel or even our own interior designers and architects. And we can do a visioneering study that establishes the ground rules to say, we're going to change this 100-year-old company and how they're going to work, how you're going to work, and we're going to provide some spaces that are going to look more like a resort or more like your kitchen or more like your bedroom, right? Not the bed, but yeah. sleeping pods. I mean, there's crazy stuff. But we're not going to be able to meet everybody's needs. And so what we want is we want to build consensus, which means that you can live with it and that you'll try it. And the good news about furniture today is it's modular. Mm -hmm. So we can build a space like Legos, rather, and if it doesn't work, then we reconfigure it. it again. Yes, and in the old days, you just couldn't do that. Think about those big steel case, yeah. steel desks. But the number one thing that comes out of the visioneering, aside from consensus on what the space should be like, they get so excited because we say, you just designed your space. Mm -hmm. and like, wow, man, engineering, customer service, accounting, marketing, we're all co it's amazing. But what we have is we have a whole bunch of stuff sitting on a big whiteboard, mm -hmm. a parking lot of things that they need to work on for leadership. Ah. Because when we're talking about this, that's a process concern. Mm -hmm. It's a company process concern. It's a principal concern. It's not where your values are clear. And when you sell furniture, they kind of look at you like, they're waiting for like the English portion of the conversation to come back. Because like, aren't you the furniture girl? And I get to say them with a lot of pride, you know, I've been doing this for 35 years as an employee, as someone in management, and now as an owner. And these are things that you're not going to resolve today. If you want to learn how to run a marathon, just start running a mile yeah. <laughs> a couple of days a week. And on Saturday, add one, add one. And before you know it, you'll get there. And it's uh, very exciting when we can work with companies who are willing to open their eyes and take the risk and, and do the things necessary doesn't happen a lot but when it does it's it's like fireworks it's yeah. amazing well it, it's amazing be, to me because there's so many elements to uh creating a community uh, you know a happy community in a company right? right to create this space that you so it starts with the space that's, right. that's where you come in but then also where you come in is like the leadership right how, is, how are people interacting like what what are the core values and that was something I was just talking to uh, one of my previous guests, uh, Patrick, and he was talking about uh, he has a commercial cleaning company, and it's gone from zero employees to 50 employees, I mean, rather quickly Fantastic. in the last two and a half years. But he's talking about how he has these core values, and everything that he does in the company always has to be filtered through these core values. Oh, yeah. And it's um, ironic because most companies that get started, they forget about that piece. And as he was saying it, quite honestly, I'm like, man, I don't have mine written down. Like, I know how I see the world and my lens and all this stuff. But it's important to make sure that you have that kind of stuff there so you can start filtering everything through that lens. Oh, yeah. And, and I think that's where the leadership comes in. But, yeah, if you're in a space that feels like the 50s or it just feels sterile... Like, how can you enjoy being there as opposed to And also, to your if house. it's not safe enough to, get, to give voice, to just say, look, this is crap. I'm not sitting in this six by six cube. I yeah. Mean, some cultures, to be successful, you don't say that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? If you're in a call center. Right. Right. So to, so to create an environment where folks can, can really give voice to what's going on. But, but the idea is you want to think of it like a, a cross, right? At the top of the cross are... It, how it should be are the needs of the individuals mm -hmm. at the bottom of the cross are the needs of the company mm -hmm. on the left side of the cross are what the individuals bring to the job and the right side of the cross are the resources that are available through the company 
And where it gets beautiful is when those things come together. But it really requires a set of values in a culture that allows you to have friction, right? We want flow, we do. We know this in athletic. I love it in the first three minutes. I hate myself when I'm running and about mile two, three, or maybe even minute five, I'm just, I'm not even on my legs anymore. Yeah. And that's what we want, we want flow. But I think we glance off of the role that friction plays. And we know this if we're athletes, we know this if we're process followers, that in order to get, I'm also a trumpet player, in order to play, you know, um, Lee Trumpet, mm -hmm. Stan Kenton, screaming lines, I gotta practice a lot of hours to get to that place. And I might not even be able to sight read some of the music and I have to get a coach to help me. Or if you're Tiger Woods, you. You know, when you paint your own picture, everything looks beautiful. You gotta have somebody help you. And so I think companies really grab a, a grasp at trying to, you know, get the intersection right, but more importantly, to use the values. And the best way to think about your values is, look, if we're at an intersection, the values kind of tell us the rights and remedies that are available to us. Right. So if we believe, as Adam Goodman used to so beautifully say, there's no one more important to me than the welfare of my people of our employees mm -hmm. but sometimes when I would be working with Adam who's 10 years younger than me right I would say Adam I'm not having a good employee experience right now I'm trying to tell you what's going on and what the obstacles are and I'm asking you to be present and I'm asking you to compromise with me and go my way and my culture gives me permission mm -hmm. so this is what he does he's like man you know what I'm sorry I'm sorry. And we've had to make amends to each other the next day after a heated conversation, but I know that he hears me and within a couple of days he'll come back and he'll say, and that's a great environment to have that, right? Like Absolutely. to be able to get to that space. And so the values can be so simple and they can help you navigate that. Mm -hmm. But as you said so wonderfully, they often kind of, we make them mm -hmm. <laughs> like our strategic plan, yeah. right? You know, your business plan to get a loan, you do it, you set yeah. it up on a, like, I got my loan. Yeah. Just set it up there and dust it off every once in a bit. And, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's really amazing what are hap what's happening to individuals as they navigate the work environment. And then what about the great resignation or the quiet quitting and, this stuff has been going on forever where you got through a period of time in your life and you look around and you're like, you know what, that's not, I'm not, I'm not feeling that anymore. Right. I'm not going to go to work in that company anymore. Maybe I've outgrown it or maybe I want to take a year off or something. It's a very exciting time. I'm awfully glad that I'm in my seventh decade while this is going on versus being in the second one or yeah. third one because I can look at it with wonder and with admiration that there is something much bigger at work here and our job is to like take the long view like really take a step back and try to understand like first of all I'm not that important I I love to talk but I'm not really that important and so if we can heed to the other person and let them have a voice when maybe this is the only place they're going to get to talk about like when you're doing your marketing and you're doing your website and the work that you do, for me going through that process, it's so unnerving. It's like taking my car into the mechanic. Mm -hmm. I have to trust what he's telling me because I don't really understand what they're saying and they're giving me examples and stuff. And so it's nice to be able to defer to somebody else, right? Like Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the important thing about relationships is you want to have those relationships of people that are just really good at what they do yeah. and you can call upon them when needed. I, like I, I, you know, referred you to a few of my friends, yeah. um, just uh, like whether it be a referral partner or somebody who has a project, just, just because I know that if they choose to go with you, great, great but I know that they're going to get a good experience. I know yeah. they're going to have a relationship that's a resource. And likewise, I, I would never introduce you to somebody that isn't a good resource, you know, back. Right. And that's really what it's all about is isn't creating it, as though? many relationships and resources around you because then I love connecting people. I know you do too. I like, do. My I favorite do. thing is being like, ah, you know, you hear a need and like, ah, you got to meet my buddy Corey or, yeah. you know, you got to. You got to talk to Jackie, yeah. or, you know, or Rachel. Rachel's so good at what she right. does. She or any of our attorneys. You know, we have three or four attorneys, and they all yeah. have different practices, different lanes, and they're all fantastic. Well, Rachel's literally spent an hour with me and my business partner because we were looking at a couple other companies uh, looking at starting, and she spent an hour with us just answering questions because she's in the field, and I'm like, 
you know, by, by the time we were done, my partner Eric had never met her before. He's like, man, that is an awesome human being. And I'm yeah. Like, she I know awesome. it's, it's cool. Plus, she's super nice. Yes. you can be awesome and still be a little bit, you know, rougher. On the yeah, end. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I'm in a bad space, I already have a big personality, and it can be super intimidating. You know, if I'm in a bad space, and yep. but Rach has got that kind of. Again, this has this goes right to the heart of what I've been thinking about so much over these last couple of years, which is, what is my vocation? What is my advocation? Right? What am I supposed to? What am I called to do? And I think Rachel is one of those people who's supposed to be working in human resources, absolutely, and doing all of that stuff. Like it, it, it definitely speaks to me when I'm chatting with her. Yep. I've taken a couple of clients who've really been sideways when we're going through a visioneering and. The employees seem to get on the same page, but the owner is like sideways. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Rach, it's not a good thing. And she's like, okay, well, let's just talk to him. Let's just see what he's got going on or what she's got going on. And I'll call her up later or she'll call me and she'll say, it was fine. You know, there's a couple of things that were sticking that are the result of something that happened some time ago. And he was just carrying it around. And we talked about it and we decided that there's a boundary. He owns the company, right? Or she owns the company. And, um... You can decide to do this or this, right? But the fact that you're with your people and they've got this consensus, don't lose sight of that, right? You've been looking for this, mm -hmm. right? To get, we want esprit de corps. Absolutely. I mean, isn't that why we love to play team sports, yeah. right? Like, it's just the most amazing thing. And um, so, when you're really, really all firing on all cylinders, it's pretty fun. And when you're not, it's really yucky. Right. <laughs> so, so I know we talked in, and you. Uh, again do long distance running and yeah. hiking how did you get into all that and like what's it done for you yeah so it's a really interesting thing it was in pursuit of a deal mm. so uh university of arizona has the arizona cancer center and 20 years ago it was established at the u of a and probably around 2010 uh, we learned that 7th Street in Van Buren was going to become this medical campus and we were going to attract the greatest minds in the world and uh, U of A was going to build the Arizona Cancer Center and initially that was going to be in partnership with one of the big hospitals, either Dignity or Banner or whatever. And so Adam Goodman says, hey, the chief oncologist, Dr. Dave, this guy's in his 70s or whatever, 80s, he's going to be speaking at True Foods. And he's going to be talking about the role that nutrition plays in the prevention of cancer, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and he goes, and we're going to go, and during the break, we're going to start building our rapport with them because it'll be six years before they break ground, and we're going to get to know every person. I'm like, I'm in. Cool. So Adam sits towards the front, and it's in a U-shape, right? It's open. Dr. Dave's in the front. And I'm kind of sitting in the back because I just want to get a lay of the land, see who's there and stuff. And he's interacting with this woman the whole time. It's not an obvious interaction, but there's a connection. So when he's talking to her, I can see that they're non-verbally interacting. Yeah. So the break comes, and I'm like, let's go get Dr. Dave. And I go, no, i got to go get that woman. There's something about that woman. Is that his wife? Is that his associate? Is that his daughter? Like, Dave, Dr. Dave was probably 5'10 and maybe 150. Runner, right? Yeah. Beautifully fit. This woman looked... Um, my size, right? Mm -hmm. Five, eight, or nine, 150 pounds, but vibrant. Mm -hmm. So I go up to her and I said, I, I'm so sorry, I didn't want to bother you, but I just noticed that there was an interesting interaction that went through you and Dr. Dave. And she said, yes, it's my husband. And I said, that's amazing. And she said, you know, I've been coming and watching his uh, shows and always there for moral support. And, and, uh, and she said, you know, and somehow she said, and uh, he doesn't run as much anymore. I said, oh, you're a runner. Now, up to this time, I'm cycling and I'm hiking. I've never run. 2010, I've never run. I wow. said, oh, you're a runner. In fact, my attitude for runners is like, oh, you're a runner. Right? Yeah. And she says, yes, I am. And I said, wow, so, uh, you know, where do you run? And she said, well, the U of A. She goes, it's a funny story, Jackie. My husband, so I want to fast forward. He was 81 and she was 79. And she looked early 60s. Wow. Easy. Yeah. And she said, what happened is when I was in my early 50s, Dr. Dave woke me up. The kids were out of the house, and we lived in a quarter. Our house was in the foothills, and we had a quarter-mile driveway. And he woke me up, and he goes, I have to revitalize your life. And he dragged me out of bed and dragged me down to the bottom of the driveway. 
and then dragged me up like I was walking. And the next day I got together with my lady friends because we're ladies who lunch, right? Yeah. They're sitting around having their lunches and she's like the nerve and they're all like, oh my God. But she realized something that maybe what we should do is we should form a group. And if we have this accountability and also, couldn't we go to Dr. Dave at the Arizona Cancer Center before they get involved with big pharma researchers, doctors and researchers have to find their own funds? And she said, if you think about this, we could build an organization that funds a couple of these doctors. Like $50,000 to a researcher who's not yet got funding yeah. is the difference between continuing his work or not. Mm -hmm. And so she's telling me this. And she'll, so she said, so, you know, 12 years ago, it's 2012, 12 years ago, I started Better Than Ever down in Tucson. And um, I did it because I needed to restart my life and also because there's a lot of cancer in my family. And I looked at her and I said, my mom and dad have cancer. My mother's mother and father died of cancer. I, I want to start one of those. So I agreed yeah. to start a Better Than Ever uh -huh. in Phoenix. And is that a running group? Then, what or? it was, in Tucson, they would, they would do 12 weeks on, 12 weeks off. Okay running first, 12 weeks off, then 12 weeks of cycling, because down in Tucson, there's some great bike races. Yeah. But So what they would do is during Christmas and summer, they wouldn't work out. And so we tried it with running and hiking. Mm -hmm. And we studied uh, uh, Dave Galloway, Jeff Galloway, and he does a, excuse me, a run-walk interval, two minutes running, one minute walking. And you can run a 12-minute mile. I'm like, well, any, I can run t two minutes. Yeah. And they had a lot of classes around nutrition and good form. And so we formed this group and we started doing that. We started raising money for the Arizona Cancer Center and we did it. And today, those people that I went hiking with were all part of Better Than Ever. It's just continued on. Now we just call it Friends Who Hike and Friends Who Run. Mm -hmm. And we were able to close that Arizona Cancer Center. We did a multi-million dollar project. Cool. The first, so you I got roped gone. in the running by, <laughs> by chasing the deal. I was, I was yeah. uh, gone by then, but... Uh. It was just one of those things where Dr. Dave said to me, you know, Jackie, my parents died from cancer mm -hmm. and you don't have to die from cancer. If you do certain things with your body, it takes such a long time to manifest it into a cancer that will kill you. You have to move, you have to have good nutrition and you, and you have to rest. Mm -hmm. wow. and, um, and he would take me in, they would have Petri dishes with cancer and they would be shaking it around and then there would be another one and be sitting and one sitting still just growing crazy and the one that's being shook around not not violently mm -hmm. just walking right yeah can't grow and that was something for me mm -hmm. and so that started me on the journey and after the first season when we did 12 weeks on and then we rested it was so brutal to get back up yeah. <laughs> and going and so we just said you know we're just gonna just do 12 weeks running then hiking running then hiking and whoever wants to come can and it got me into strength training so I found a couple of guys are up at my office. They were the first um, uh, conditional coaches for the Kansas City Royals, so they're older guys. Mm -hmm. And I went to do, when I started doing endurance stuff, I realized that I wasn't strong enough. So my body fat mm -hmm. was higher than what most athletes were. I had good distance times and I could do it, but I was really doing it, you know, white knuckling yeah. it. And so I went in and I started doing conditioning training and more importantly, balance and flexibility because the older I got, you know, I started running when I was in my 50s. Mm -hmm. And um, th so they really introduced me to this whole idea about like what we should be doing to our bodies. He said, you know, what you do in your 50s dictates the quality of life you have in your 80s. Doesn't determine your life, whether you live past your 80s. It's how you feel yeah. and how you move in your 80s. And that really spoke to me because they were like, you know, 10 years older than me. And that's so important, too, because those things um, matter. Your quality of life matters, right? Oh. I don't want to live to be 150. I don't. Uh, if, if I'm, you know, yeah, I can't walk. But I would I like to be move. like 96, like the queen. That's not a bad age. Yeah, That's well, 96 is great. But like to your point, though, I want a quality of life there. I don't want to That's not right. be able to walk and, you know, practically be a. a I don't want to be that guy to where people come and visit every once in a while and there's just that unsaid spoken thing, yeah. oh, that poor old man. Yes. You know? I don't want to be that. So that's why fitness for me is such a big thing and I know it is for you too, but like even nutrition, like there's, yes. I, I eat a certain way so I can feel a certain way. That's right. And that's, it's important. And if you do that and establish those habits now, and, and like you said in the 50s, I'm about to turn 40 here in six months, um, but like 
I can only imagine it's going to help me in my 50s and 60s yeah. and 70s, right? And they say that, you know, these four ideas, uh, fitness, nutrition, rest, and then friends, friendships. Yeah. So try to get three or four out of them each day. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to have a bad day in nutrition and you're going to stop by and get a Big Mac or whatever, make sure that you pick up the phone and call a buddy. Like I'll call Hank later on and just say, hey, Hank, how was it? And he'll be like... It's just really trying to understand that quality of life it plays such an important role, important role in how we feel and our resiliency. I think about COVID and all of those things that happened with individuals that got so awfully sick. Mm -hmm. And um, it really sh shone a light. It shed a light onto some of these lifestyle illnesses and some of these chronic illnesses. Some of them aren't lifestyle. They're, you know their nature genetic mm -hmm. right yeah. and my doc says jackie if you've got cancer diabetes glaucoma you're native american there's alcoholism there's addiction some of the nature we can't take care of mm -hmm. right but the nurture part is going to really push you over the edge right yeah so if you have diabetes <laughs> then moving and eating really becomes a critical part of like how you feel every day but you know, I, why didn't we learn that in school? Like, why did I have to get to be 50? And I think it was because I got to connect with Dr. Dave's wife. And the next year she did um, Rim to Rim in the Grand Canyon. And it really what opened my eyes because we were doing like local hikes and I started thinking, you know, we need to be doing some endurance stuff because there's beautiful places around here. Mm -hmm. And we need to go and do some trail running and go to some beautiful locales and right, like run along the Pacific Coast Highway or get up into the redwoods of California or go to Utah or, you know, it really opened my eyes. And I wouldn't have gotten there had it not been for this lady's story about, and she was so mad, you know, yeah. how dare him? Yeah. Well, I think there's something to that too, is being open to opportunities like that and being open to, uh, I don't know everything. And that one person, that one conversation helped change your trajectory. It did. It'll do that for all of us if we're just aware that, any interaction can have that impact. And yeah. you don't know what impact it's gonna have on your life when yours, it, it was health, it was you know, yeah. uh, living you know, uh, in a better way, but it could be something for business. And it's just that being open to conversations with new people is my favorite thing. Oh, and, um, I just think, I think there's so much opportunity. And one of the things that I try to do is keep myself open you know, I, I learned that the subconscious mind's job is to keep you alive, mm -hmm. right? It keeps your heart pumping. It keep, and the conscious mind, if you're cogitating on something, this was Dr. De Dennis, Deaton, uh, Dr. Dennis Deaton, and he wrote something called the um, Winning the Inner Game and Ownership Spirit. And he said, when you're cogitating on something, the subconscious mind will just send you ideas to solve it. The conscious mind will grab it and look at it to see your capability and your values and stuff like that. And if it doesn't fit, it discards it right away. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is, the subconscious mind is a place that's so much more open than, than what the conscious mind is. Yeah. And when you're relaxed, he used to give this example. You know, I'm a, I'm a young guy. I'm 24 years old. My wife is pregnant. We have a two-year-old. She um, is staying at home. And I just lost my job as an electrician. And I'm driving down the freeway. And I just am thinking, oh, my God, you know, I got to do something. And, and the first thought that comes to mind is I can, I'll rob a bank. And he's in the car by himself. And he looks around. And he goes, oh, my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Well, the subconscious mind sent it. The conscious mind looked at there. it, yeah. and he's like, oh, no, I don't do that. Yeah. Then it gets stuck in traffic, and he sees that all of these cars, that um, there's somebody that's on the side of the road that is asking for money, someone homeless, somebody who's in need, and then there's another person, or maybe it's across the way, that's in a um, car wash. And he's thinking, wow, couldn't we just take people who are at need, in need and connect them with jobs like that, car wash job. And he ended up forming a company, wow. right? He ended up forming a company by going down to nonprofit organizations like St. Vincent de Paul and some of these other organizations where these guys get some job training and they get some dignity because they're making income and it solved his problem. And so, but you know, when he got that idea, he said, well, it's not, it's not against the law. Mm -hmm. It's a long shot though. I don't know anything about nonprofits. I don't know how to make that work. And so they say that the great minds will grab those kind of like just off cuff ideas and they'll capture them somewhere. Yeah. Right? That's why I always have a yellow pad around me because I always want to write too. I, I believe I have a pretty good memory, but nobody has a good enough memory to have, 
to capture every idea and to remember every idea that comes to you. Right. And if you don't write it down, like there's a good chance you will forget. You know, your day goes on. <laughs> That's right. um, this is awesome. I, I, I know people are getting a ton of this. If they, if they are interested in you know what you can do for them from right. a design side, where, where can they go? Yes, so our company is, uh, you can reach me at Jackie, J-A-C-Q-U-I, at air, A-I-R-I-N-A-Z, airinaz.com. You can find us on social, so we're on LinkedIn, and we're on Instagram. And really what we want is just a telephone call to say, hey, can you come out and talk to us? It's a free consultation. It's either they've got an active project and they ha need needs assessment, and that's where we establish the design direction, the budget, mm -hmm. so it gives an idea. Or maybe it's somebody that is just doing their staffing plan. We got a call yesterday from one of our favorite clients, Aquatots, and she goes, I'm finishing my staffing plan for 2022 and 2023, and I got to fit more people in here. How do we get that done? And so that's just free consultation. Let's do some design. Let's think about what's going on, lay some stuff out, come up with some options. So really it's just as easy as an email or an instant message or text or phone call. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know people got a ton out of this. Uh, I did too, but I will say I, I love your energy from the time I met you. I think it was like five years ago. I'm like, that, that's there's something special about you. And, and I, <laughs> I'm you. sure you know that, but uh, you know, from an outside perspective, I just want to tell you that. So thank Aww. you for coming on today. This is, this is amazing. Guys, I know you got a ton out of this. Um, check out Jackie, go on Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, connect with her because whether you need her services or not, uh, you know somebody who does. So let's uh, let's support her. Appreciate you guys. We'll see you next time.